I like to find myself in the story of Scripture. Now, what I mean by that is when I read the words in, in the stories, I like to put myself into the stories and look for ways that I can apply the things that the people in the stories were going through into my own life. And, and I think that's, well, it's actually a pretty helpful way to approach the Bible. Uh, and that's pretty much how I've always looked at this wise man story, uh, looking at it like, well, what can I learn from the wise men about finding joy in the journey, even when it's kind of long and difficult and a little bit uncertain? Yeah. Things like, well, what can I learn from the wise men about perseverance? Or what can I learn from the wise men about worship? Or, or what can I learn from the wise men about uh, giving and generosity? Or, or what can I learn from the wise men about seeking Jesus? Or what can I learn from the wise men about responding to Jesus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and certainly there's a lot that I can learn from looking at the story that way. But while I can find myself in the story using that approach, the story is, is not about me. The story is about Jesus. Jesus is, is the main character, the main focus of what's happening. And, and so this time, as I was digging into that text, I wanted to approach that from, from that perspective. What is this story telling me about Jesus? And why do I need to know that? And what does it matter for my life today? I mean, think about those questions as you listen to the story. It's found in Matthew chapter 2. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea when Herod was king. After Jesus' birth, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem. They asked, where is the one who was born to be the king of the Jews? We saw his star rising and have come to worship him. When King Herod and all Jerusalem heard about this, they became disturbed. He called together all the chief priests and the experts in the scriptures and tried to find out from them where the Messiah was supposed to be born. They told him in Bethlehem, in Judea. The prophet wrote about this. Bethlehem in the land of Judah, you are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. A leader will come from you. He will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the wise men and found out from them exactly when the star had appeared. As he sent them to Bethlehem, he said, go and search carefully for the child. When you have found him, report to me so that I may go and worship him too. After they had heard the king, they started out. The star they had seen rising led them until it stopped over the place where the child was. They were overwhelmed with joy to see the star. When they entered the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary. So they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. God warned them in a dream not to go back to Herod, so they left for their country by another road. Now when I read that story from the perspective of what does this tell me about Jesus, what jumps out at me is that Jesus is God. Jesus is God, and there are actually several things here that, that sort of hint at that. Now, it, it's not a full, complete picture yet. Um, as we look at some of the events in the life of Jesus in the weeks ahead, that will become clearer and clearer uh, that Jesus isn't just a, a baby or a child or a man, that Jesus is my Lord and my God. In fact, there were actually a few hints dropped about that in the birth narratives already. You've got the angel's announcement to Joseph. Let me read that, Matthew 1, 23. The virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And then you've got the angel's announcement to Mary, Luke chapter 1, verse 35. The angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come to you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the holy child developing inside you will be called the Son of God. And then you've got the angel's announcement to the shepherds. Luke chapter 2, verse 11. Today, your Savior, Christ the Lord, was born in David's city. So you've got these little hints dropped there. And now, in this story of, of the wise men coming to Jesus from the east, most likely someplace like ancient Persia or Babylon, again, there's more hints there dropped in the story. Hint number one 
is this special star that appears. All right, now, the wise men were people who studied the stars. And as they did, they came to believe, among other things, that the consistency in the pattern of the stars and, and the way they moved across the skies consistently, night after night and season after season, represented sort of the, the order of the universe. And so if something happened here, that, that broke in to, the, to that unvarying order of the universe and, and like this special star that, that totally changed things and just showed up this one-time phenomena. It was kind of like to them as if the God was breaking into his ordered universe and going to make some special announcement. And then if you couple that with that, that what the uh, wise men would have been thinking with what the people that's reading what Matthew wrote would have been hearing as well and, and thinking they would have been thinking about the ancient um, Old Testament texts and a lot of those ancient Old Testament texts w would have the the glory of God the, the glory of God showing itself a, as light and, and so there's that first hint that this this newborn king of the Jews is more than just a normal human baby Hint number two, that, that Jesus is God, is that phrase, King of the Jews. Now again, the wise men went to Herod's palace because that was the natural place they thought this King of the Jews would be born. And so asking where's the King of the Jews is just kind of a normal, innocent question for them. However, Herod makes this immediate connection here between that phrase, King of the Jews, and the promised Messiah, the Christ. And so what Herod does is he summons the religious scholars and he asks them, where is this anointed one of God to be born? Uh, again, subtle hint, yes. But, but another hint, especially again to the readers of this story, that the child the wise men were seeking, that Jesus, was actually God. Hint number three is, is the star reappearing again. And this time, according to Matthew's account, he's, the star is actually directing them right to the place where Jesus was, which had to be something like supernatural because if it was just the star way up in the sky, well, well Jerusalem and Bethlehem are something like five to six miles apart. So it's going to look in both places as if that star is in the same spot and if it's not moving. Uh, so the fact that Matthew records that the star actually showed them where the house was, showed that God is doing something special, something supernatural, something spectacular here to circumvent the, the normal order of nature, which again, I think is a subtle hint that, that God's, God's up to something and that this child is more than he appears. And then hint number four is that when the wise men actually got to the house where Jesus was, they bowed down and, and Matthew says they worshiped him. Now, while the wise men using that term might have just been thinking that they were honoring this child by, by bowing down and, and, and worshiping him, the reader of Matthew's account is gonna pick up something more there. You see, because that particular word for worship is one that Matthew uses often in contexts where Jesus' more than human status is recognized. Now again, we have the advantage of seeing the whole Bible to, to see this, this through, but even back then, especially to the first readers of Matthew's story, but but even to the wise men themselves, there were, I think, hints, not only that God was up to something, but, but also that this child, Jesus, was in fact God come to live with us. And perhaps, perhaps God still operates that way today in some instances. Now again, certainly from the Bible, from the Bible we can see that Jesus is God. But I also think that God, from time to time, drops hints into our own stories, just like he did with the wise men. Drops hints into our own stories that point us in that same direction. And before we go on in this conversation, I just want you to stop and think about that for a moment. What hints 
have you received that Jesus is God in the way you've seen God working in your own story? Hit pause and think about that for a few moments right now. Jesus is God. But that also brings up another important question. What kind of God is Jesus? You see, without any special revelation, people tend to think of God as, as a little scary, or, or maybe a lot scary. You see, because with the word God comes the idea of power, much greater power than, than you or I have. And the fear is, if I step out of line, or if I make God angry, then, then God can, can squash me. Or he can just toy with me for his own amusement if he wants to do that. Power. And with the word uh, God also comes the idea of exclusive access. As if only special people or powerful people or privileged people or the people born to the right people can get close to God or are wanted by God. Power and exclusive access is, is how we naturally think about God. And, and that leaves you both a little scared of God and also a little skeptical that God has your best interests at heart. And, and so that also leaves you kind of wanting some, some distance between yourself and God and, and thinking that maybe God kind of wants that distance too. Well, God drops hints into this story to show that Jesus is not like that at all. See, what I see this story hinting at is, is that God is patient with questions and, and with seekers and, and that God's inclusive, uh, not exclusive, and, and that God's actually humble and approachable. Let's take those hints one at a time. Hint number one, God is patient with questions and with seekers. Now, think about this when you think about the story here. Uh, it, it was a slow and kind of meandering journey for the wise men to get to Jesus, not a quick straight line one. I mean, first there was just this, this natural phenomena, this appearance of the star, and then there's all sorts of questions about, well, what does this mean? And so further study and probably some more questions. And then finally, oh, destination, Israel. And then probably more questions, logistical questions of how do we put all this together to go there. And, and then the long trip. <laughs> and on that long trip, that probably a whole bunch more questions the longer and longer it got. Uh, and, and then they got to Jerusalem where they logically expected the, this king of the Jews to be, and that's not where he was. And so more questions and, and more seeking. And then they're clued in by, by Herod's advisors that, okay, head to Bethlehem. And then they head there and, and the star reappears and maybe more questions in their seeking is, is well, why is this happening as it reappears, but also some joy. And then they, they get to the place where Jesus was as the star kind of like a GPS just locates them right there. And then they, they've journeying back to their homeland by an even longer route because God told them that was the safe way to go. And again, probably more questions and questions and, and things to talk about as they're trying to make sense of, of everything that they'd seen. And all that, all that took time. It, it took lots of time. And, and they were seeking and questioning. And, and as they were, I think they were probably slowly growing in understanding each time that they experienced something new along the way. And, and you know what? God's okay with that. I mean, God's okay with all their questions, all their exploring, all their seeking, and all the time it takes for them to actually find him. You see, I think our questions and our seeking, what it, what it does is it actually gives the Holy Spirit a little room to operate. And the Holy Spirit 
doesn't need more than a little room uh, to work with. And I think that's why there's probably some truth to the tradition that these wise men have ended up becoming believers. See, it's because God has patience with people. Right? God has patience with peoples, and, and God knows that sometimes, sometimes it's the meandering road that actually gets people to him faster than the ram it down their throat, uh, I know this is right, so listen to me. This is best for you. Do it that way. This is good for your approach. See, what matters to God, what matters to God is that people seek him and that they find him. That they seek him and they find him. And if that's going to take some, some time, well, God's willing to put in the time and to be patient with the seeking and to keep dropping a few more clues along the way. Now again, take a few minutes to think about how that applies to your own questions and, and to the questions of others. What does this aspect of, of the story tell you about being patient with people's questions and about your own seeking and searching for more? Go ahead, pause, and think about that a few, for a few moments before moving on in this conversation. So God is patient with our seeking and, and our questions. Really, really patient. Uh, God, God gets us that even after we, we find him, many of us still have all sorts of questions. And, and I think this story shows us again that, that God's okay with that. Uh, God loves people that much. Another thing that shows that, that God loves people that much Here's a second hint dropped in the story here, and that's that, that God is inclusive, not exclusive. Let me say that again. God is inclusive, not exclusive, which is not how most people tend to see things. All right? Most people tend to think that the, the God Club is rather exclusive. Only a few invited and, and even fewer actually let in. But, but this story hints that that sort of thinking is, is wrong. All right, consider the wise men when they started out on this journey. They weren't Jewish. They weren't believers in the one true God. They had some familiarity with some of the Jewish texts and faith in, in sort of a general way, but they had their own religion and their own beliefs. And at this point in time, almost nobody, just Mary and Joseph and the shepherds with those angel announcements had even the remotest clue that, that Jesus was God. He looked like every other little child. But if the wise men had known that, that would have been just like this, this radical, almost unthinkable proposition to them that the God of Israel would actually be inviting Gentiles to come and worship him. You see, in the day, the Jews had all sorts of laws about contact with Gentiles, about what was acceptable and what wasn't. And the things that most Gentiles said and did weren't really appropriate for good Jewish church people. And good Jewish church people were concerned, well, if we have this contact with Gentiles, we might become polluted or corrupted if we hang out with them or if they just kind of those people worshipped with us. And, and if Jews were to accept Gentiles on some basis, well, then those Gentiles, they needed to follow the, the right steps first. And those were difficult, really difficult, especially for men. In short, by, by Jesus' time, well, most good Jewish church people started thinking, hey, God's just for us. God's just for us and, and for those like us or maybe for those who are sort of like us if they're willing to follow all the right steps. And there were definite, you don't cross this line spots, right? Um, and God says, no, wrong, wrong. That's not what I'm like and, and you shouldn't be either. 
See, God's saying by inviting these Gentiles to be one of the first people to, to see Jesus and to worship him, he's saying, I'm not exclusive. God's saying God is inclusive, that, that God invites all people, no matter who they are, no matter where they've been, no matter what they've done, no matter what they've thought or what they've done to come into relationship with him. And he demonstrates that right from the beginning of Jesus' life by inviting these Gentiles to come and worship Jesus. Now, don't misunderstand me. When I say that God is inclusive, that doesn't mean the rules don't matter. It doesn't mean that everything's okay. It doesn't mean that there are no rights and wrongs. Uh, there are. But what, what God is inclusive means is that Jesus is for everyone. All right, Jesus is for everyone regardless of, of race or place or politics or even how, how pure their doctrine is. I mean, God wants everyone to know Jesus. And God invites everyone to know Jesus. And God is so gracious that he actually initiates that contact. And he starts right where people are. Even if starting where they are is what you'd say is kind of a wrong place. And then God nudges people gently closer and closer on a journey of finding Jesus and coming to know Jesus and in wanting to worship Jesus. That's what God is like. Which brings me to the third hint I see dropping in here. And that's that, that God is humble and approachable. Humble and approachable. I mean, if you look at the story, where did the wise men find Jesus? In a house, not a palace. Not surrounded by layers and layers of gatekeepers. Not wearing special clothes, not putting on any pretenses, uh, not acting self-important, not charging anything for the privilege of, of seeing him. I mean, you didn't have to do anything to have a special audience with Jesus here. Nothing special to do, nothing special to bring, no hoops to jump through, no special procedures to follow, no special rules to follow. And the story gives me an impression that when, when the wise men found Jesus, they, they just kind of walked right up to him. They walked right up to him, and while they, while they did bring gifts, that was an admission charge. Uh, that was like a response to seeing the one they were looking for. And, and it was actually just like an extension, an expression of, of their worship. Right? Jesus was accessible. Pretty much accessible and approachable by anyone, anytime. Humble in appearance. Humble in attitude. Humble in his birth. Humble in his life. Humble even to the point of being willing to die on a cross. Be willing to die on a cross in order to forgive our sins and enable us to have a fresh start with God. As he right from the very beginning and all the way through his life, Jesus wanted us to know what a, what a special God he is. A God who is truly with us and, and near us and, and for us. And a God who loves us. A God who loves us and, and wants us to find him and doesn't put any obstacles in the way of you knowing him in, in a close and a personal way. So the more and more you read the story of Jesus, the more you see that. But I think the hints are there even here at the very beginning. Hints that, that God's patient with our questions and our seeking. Hints that, that God is inclusive, not exclusive. Hints that God is, is humble and approachable. Hints that, that God is with us and for us and, and loves us and, and wants us to find him. You know, to me, that kind of a God is a God worth seeking. That kind of a God is a God worth considering. That kind of a God is a God worth worshiping. That kind of a God is a God worth following. And that kind of a God is a God worth imitating.